Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we will now start the second lecture of this Internet Forum public lecture series. And actually, today we are concentrating on issue which, which is actually very important to each of us. We are talking about the health care. And we are talking about the digital transition of the health care. Because probably some of you know already, there are lots of issues happening when we put in the same sentence healthcare, future, and digitalization. And as you know, all the lectures will be found in the internet, also the edited versions afterwards. And the first lecture last week, the transportation. Uh, will be found very soon in the Internet Forum web page. And next week we will be in this same lecture hall and then we will start at the same time and then the topic will be my data. And if you want to discuss or share your ideas or photos, whatever, in Twitter, we are using the hashtag AaltoDigi in this lecture series. Actually, I have to mention both you here in the lecture hall and all you who are following this live stream via internet that I just ran from the airport. I was in the uh, Krakow in the European Cybersecurity uh, Forum where more or less all the European cybersecurity experts gather once a year. And the main topic what we were actually talking about this year was about skillful people which are needed more and more both in digitalization and both in digital security. And the biggest que question actually in that conference wasn't any technological solution, wasn't uh, any cyber warfare issue. It was about how we educate, how we produce as universities, as nations, skillful, talented people to face this new reality what we are heading to in the future. And then we talk about the digitalization and the very fast and accelerating uh, development of the technology. And I think that is the main point what we are talking here today. Healthcare, digital transition of it. And therefore, I am very happy and honored, honored to say that we have two excellent speakers uh, today. Bisa Honkanen from HUS. He will start, and I know that you will hear excellent presentation from him. And secondly, Eva Nyberg Oksanen from Terveystalo. She will continue, and I am sure that we all know a lot more on, uh, on these issues after these two lectures. But without, without any further words, Visa, welcome to Thank our you. university, to Thank our you. public lecture series, and please, floor is yours. Thank you so much and thanks for the invitation and, and thanks for being here this late in the day uh, talking with a, about a topic which is extremely important and extremely acute also in healthcare, the digitalization of healthcare and all the possibilities it offers to us and also some of the worries that it will bring, bring, bring with it. So I hope this will be kind of interaction. I myself, I'm a, and this is just to show you that how the doctor sees digitalization is that it's, it's a great thing, but it's a tool, it's not a goal or the aim. And if you think about the killer applications in the history, I think stone axe is one of them because it was number one application almost for two million years. So in digital way, we are still very much in the beginning. But we are advancing fast and we doctors try to keep abreast with this very fast development in technology and also in the ways it's now brought into the healthcare and caring people. So really I'm pediatrician and, and, and pediatric rheumatologist by education, which means that when I think about healthcare and health, I think about a child with a severe serious disease. I do not think about a triathlonist 
who is quantifying herself 24-7 to break one more new record. So that's my perspective and that also shows in what I will talk today. So it's just one perspective, but the one which I have spent a lot of, of, of my professional life. Currently I work as a director of strategic development in Helsinki University Hospital. I came back in, uh, in uh, University Hospital two years ago and, and basically in the beginning my work was a bit like fussy that what should I be doing with this kind of title. But very soon it came very clear that almost anything you try to develop today has IT in there. So every project is an IT project. And, and today my closest almost like colleague in, in, in a whole hospital on a daily basis is our IT development director. Uh, Mikko Rotun, and many of you may, may even know him, and, and, and he's the guy who's basically from IT and from technology, but has spent tens of years in university hospital setting. And I think this kind of combination is, is many ways ideal, that I'm a doctor who understands very little about technology, but, but some rudimentary level, I'm, I'm still there. And then we have technology expert who actually has quite wide experience and understanding about the healthcare. So basically we can somehow speak the same language even if we are from, from different professions. Uh, so this is the mission you see in here, or the value we have in, in, in our hospital when it comes to the developing the healthcare. And this is of course something which digitalization brings a great promise that basically you can give the best of care not based on, on, on where do you live or how rich you are, but on, based on your needs. And this last thing is something which I added in this just a few months ago that also it can't be dependent on your digital dexterity. So this is different from, if we digitalize healthcare is kind of morally and ethically different from digitalizing, for instance, banking business. That in banking business, you, it's not wrong to powerfully force people to use digital services, but in, in healthcare, you can't say to a person that if you use our digital services, you get a quick diagnosis for your cancer. But, but if you can't use those services, the diagnosis of your cancer might be delayed or diagnosis of some severe disease. So the only solution in this case is that we have to develop such a good service digitally that people want to use it and then we will have more time for those people who don't want to use it or who cannot use it. And I think you know this better than me that it's not age dependent issue at all. Actually, up to 85, 90 years of age, I think the digital dexterity and, and the ability to use digital services is not that different from the young people. Good example was that when we now develop these digital services, we basically put an announcement that everybody who is interested in, in, in testing our applications and services um, can give their name. And, and we got 350 or something around that names in, in three days. And, and basically almost half of them were people who were already retired. Of course, partly because they have more time, they are usually very interested in their health, but they are also very skillful in using digital services and very willing to use them. So, so this is not kind of gender, uh, not, uh, sorry, the, um, generation issue, issue at all. Oh, I even have this kind of. So basically this comes to this age thing uh, before I go to, to actual uh, this, uh, basic or, or core substance of, of my presentation. Why do we need these e-health services? The first answer very often is that we have this terrible burden from the elderly people and now we have to have some kind of quick fixes to, to, to be able to handle all these uh, sick old people. But if you look at, for instance, this graph, basically we got as many people outside the workforce 100 years ago as we have today. 100 years ago, most of them were those blue ones the young ones, and now most of them are the old ones, but still the percentage is around 70. However, of course, it's increasing, so it, it, it will be, be some kind of problem, but not that bad as is some, sometimes proposed. 
And also the length of those very sick years when the people need a lot of services, it has not increased. There is quite good evidence that that's not the case. Uh, I think we have a positive problem in terms of digital healthcare evolution, that because of all the technologies technological advancement, we have more possibilities to help people. Only artificial organs are now estimated to be like multi-billion dollar business in, in, in few years from now. And with all the other technological solutions, we have so much to give to our sick patients. And if we do this right, we can improve the access, we can decrease the costs, and we can increase the quality. And if we digitalize wrong, we can decrease the quality, we can suffocate the access with all kind of failure demand created by digital services, and, and we can even increase the cost because we can increase demand in such a way that basically the totality of healthcare costs goes up. And this is very important thing to consider just now when we have all these renovations of our social and healthcare system coming in effect in, in very, very uh, near future. So yes, we have to digitalize, but we have to do it smartly, and we have to all the time follow what happens when we digitalize. Do we really get the good things we wanted to get and, and didn't get the bad things we didn't want to have? So this is something, of course, you are much more aware of this uh, change which is happening than me. So now, Distance doesn't count anymore that way in many, many situations. I think even more important is this datafication, which is somebody was here talking about cybersecurity. Uh, it's a, somehow also a frightening thing that, that anything I or our kids do is recorded and traceable even 10 years after it had happened. And this has a great impact on healthcare if we think that we, for instance, uh, switch to more of these kind of insurance-based system that sooner or later somebody says to you that if you give me access to your Facebook profile for the last 10 years, you will get the discount on your insurance payments. And then something stupid you have done when you were 15 uh, will be visible and, and then you may suffer from that. So, so. Uh, I, I, I think it, it, it's something we have to take care of that this does not harm people, this will help people. And then cybernetics, which again, things you, you understand much more than me, but basically I understand it as a complicated interacting systems and very often complicated interacting systems where there are machines and humans interacting together. And this is something which will change the doctor's profession profoundly, since already today we don't get only the information from our devices and monitors, we also get analytic proposals. And I think very soon, very in near future, we get some proposals from very complicated analytics, kind of from the black box. And then basically it's not possible anymore to go all the way back to, to see how the machine make this kind of proposal, what was the logic and, and, and thinking behind the proposal, should I take this, should I treat the patient as this, this machine proposes me, or, or should I do something else, and, and who is responsible if something goes wrong, and, and if I don't obey, then am I in, in, in trouble legally or, or otherwise. And this is something which, for instance, in a country like United States, I think it's, it's very, very kind of uh, acute issue because already now they have quite a lot of lawyers in there in healthcare, so it only will get, get worse in, 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 in future. And, and machines start to talk with each other, they do that already, and when those talk about your health and, 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 and make treatment decisions based on that talk, so it, it's a whole different world which is coming, coming up, and, and I think it's coming up sooner than we think. So when I speak about, as I already said, I will not speak about wellness, and digitalization of wellness in, in, in healthcare. I speak more about uh, sickness part of this equation. So that means individual medical solutions and also population-based medical services. Of course, there is no like clear 
border between those two, that, that we have wellness information which we can utilize in, in, in treating sick patients and, and so on. And this is also something we have to learn now because we don't know yet how to interpret all the data which comes from the quantified self already today from many of my, my even my patients. I'm pediatrician, so basically uh, I still have some practice every week and, and, and there is very seldom a family who comes to me without some kind of digital recording of the symptoms or, or, or video how they limp or something like that. So, so in that uh, primitive way, it's, it's already there. So here are some of the points I, I took as a promises and also something we have to bear in mind so that they don't do any harm for our patients. Yes, we will have quantified self and we doctors, as doctors, we have to, in an accepting way, learn how to utilize that data. And it's a learning curve. We don't want to be choked by, by all the recordings some people may, may bring with them. We have to understand what does that mean for the health, really. And then also, of course, bad. In US, they are very good in, in, in uh, developing new diagnoses. And, and my bet is that in the nearest, next five years, they will have a new diagnosis which have a name, this is just like half jokingly, uh, health compulsive disorder or something, that the person is quantifying herself or himself so actively that he gets anxiety and, and can't sleep anymore, and then there must be clinics who treat these patients with this quantified self-anxiety. So there will be always good and bad when the, when the technology goes, goes. And then, of course, we have to be very aware about unreliable or untested devices. I think you know and we know that many of these kind of monitors already, if they are not properly tested, they may give results which make you just worry for, for, for nothing. And in the same way, when we then go to more in the medical side, then, of course, the reliability is everything. And that's in a way, good thing, because I think if there is something good in Finnish technology as a Nokia legacy or, or, or otherwise, that in Finland, as I have been led to understood, we are quite good in, in manufacturing devices which can measure something very accurately. And, and when we go to real medicine to help the real decisions on sick people, the reliability is everything. The downsides of these kind of remote monitoring and devices is that you may end up in a situation where you see only the measurements from the devices and, and, and you are busy and, and, and you are kind of forced to start to make diagnostic or treatment decisions based on two sparse data. So paradoxically, we can be in a situation where all this technological in uh, advancement uh, uh, creates a situation where doctors do decisions based on not what they see, what they feel, what they learn when doing a proper examination, but maybe the streams of two or three devices of some vital signs, and, and, and that might not be good because what you get in a physical confront, uh, contact with the patient and the family, the amount of information is of course, huge compared to any kind of measured values. And then if we have more and more of these kind of population-based health services, uh, it's great and I believe that will be one of the solutions to, to, to get people, make people happier and also, also save some money. But we have to be aware that, that it doesn't create inequality in the healthcare, that those who are skillful in using those services get better service than those who, who are not. So this is, before we go to, to what I would like to see as, as a future of, of, of digitalized healthcare, is this is what medicine can do. We can cure sometimes, not that often, but sometimes. We can make people better very often. We can almost always decrease the suffering. And sometimes we can even prevent. But I would say that the prevents, pre, how much we can prevent is still kind of overrated. Vaccinations are great. We have been able to go down with smoking and that has made a big health impact. But many of the things we say that help to prevent things have not been actually properly studied. 
And here's one great chance for digital revolution, that from this on, when we can record everything in this kind of situation, even in, with the large population, we are able to actually see which preventive measures work and which do not. And then we can save money and focus on the things which really work. But really, I think the big thing is that today we can, many of those diseases which previously were deadly, like many cancers, uh, many autoimmune diseases and so on, are now more like a chronic disorders. And that's a great thing. But now those patients very often have a big burden in, in running in different kind of checkups on regular basis and they lose time from their kids and they lose time from their work because they have to do this. And here we have a great opportunity for different kind of digital services and, and, and devices to help those people with their chronic disorders to live happy and as normal as possible life. I think that's maybe the most important, as I see, of course, but that might maybe because I'm, I'm my, my history, as I told this, is from treating kids with uh, long-term severe diseases. And we don't want to bring them to the hospital too often if it's possible to avoid that. So this is the dream, customer-driven, lean and digitally enhanced healthcare, where basically the customer has a healthcare issue, he contacts the digital in interface or digital service, very often get the answer right back and, and, and then can go on living. And, and if not, this digital surf, uh, service could know, would know every day a bit better how to refer this patient exactly in the right place exactly where he gets the help. And this is, of course, something we don't know how to do yet. So that's the reason we have to start to collect big data from that kind of services we are now introducing, electronic e-health e services, and, and, and then analyze those data. And because that data will be huge, we can't analyze it with the, only with human brain. We need, need also artificial intelligence and machine learning to help us in this analytics. And then with this analytics, we can kind of smoothen this mirror all the time so that it better and better can refer, refer the patient exactly to that professional who can give the answer or help to that patient. And then we would get rid of this failure demand because a failure demand, I think, is the biggest based in healthcare today, which means that, that we create contacts and interventions which actually don't add value for the patient. You get the patient on your office, you just to be safe side, you take like erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is a bit increased very often. You start to study more and then you find something else and then basically you end up in a situation where a person has been visiting doctor 10 times, nothing has been found except some anxiety at the end and, and, and it's, it's just waste and, and failure demand. So if we can do this, we would make people happier and save a lot of money and make better health. I think this is something, and this is only possible with the digital e health and, and, and using the advanced technologies like artificial intelligence. And, and here come machine learning comes definitely in the picture. This is just something I don't go to this in, 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 in detail, but this is what we now have as a e-health services in Helsinki University Hospital. We have built e-health services for mental disorders and mental problems, uh, weight problems, rare diseases, and now we just opened the women's house, which is basically there is a digital path for, for normal pregnancies so that they don't have to come to here and learn things to the hospital, except maybe one time, and rest of the time they just, you know, get the same information, same help and same interactive help also do the digital services. And this is a big endeavor. So during the next two years, we will build these services for each of our specialties. And we just got an announcement last week from the Ministry of Social Affairs uh, that we will get help from them monetary-wise as well. So, so this is a big project just started. And I believe that there will be a lot of collaboration between different act actors around this project. What we have been focused is that we get real services up and running as soon as possible, but then we have to go to this analytics side, that we have to study every service, that does it really work, how much it, it changes the health behavior, uh, what does it do to the budget and, 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 and everything. So we have to study. 
And this is just one of my favorites. I think we have been able to build these services quite fast now because we have taken this kind of uh, workman attitude in there. And, and I think Thomas Edison is also a good person to show in here because if there was one who was focused on testing his products, I think it was Thomas Edison. If I remember correct, it was the light bulb number 900 and something which finally burned so long that Thomas Edison was ready, ready to, to, to sell it and, and, and make it a business. So no beta versions for, for, for sales, if you really want to do it properly first. And I think this is something we should have this kind of mindset as well that whatever we start, we study it and as fast as possible check that whether it works or not. We have bad examples a lot in there. In, and as you know, the application universe is, is, is totally uncontrollable at the moment. I think it's, it's only, and especially in health because it has been very, very uh, popular to do health apps. So what we have now done is that we have a one common platform so that if anybody wants to develop a health app, uh, she or he or they can develop it so that it fits to the, this health university hospital and, and then actually from this on for the national platform. So basically every, hosp every university hospital and, 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 and people who are customers for the hospitals can basically use the same applications and it will be easier for us to do the interfaces and everything. So this is important. Plan to check, check, act, or then kill. So now about this, we need this data, and, and we need big data, and we will get the big data. But how can we ensure that with this big data we could also get better decisions? You are better than me in numbers. Zeta byte, I think it's 21 zeros bytes after one. And, 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 and somebody has estimated that 2012, there were in the world 2.8 zettabytes, and, and then 2020, there will be 40 zettabytes. So, so basically, the amount of data is doubling, not every year, but maybe every one and a half year. And, and, and as you know, the big data, it's not only that there's a lot of data, but it it's, uh, increases rapidly, and, and it, it's... Uh, it's very variable, it's not anymore structured, it's all kind of unstructured data, and this is very much true with the healthcare data in many instances. And then you can't rely on it as much as you have been able to do with this sparse data you have been working with before. And this is something so that we would understand the possibilities and limitations of big data. This is something we have to work very closely with your kind of people and, and we have already a lot of collaboration with Alta University because that's where the brain are. Uh, so, uh, but there's so much to learn. There's a big promise and it's kind of buzzword as you know, but, but I still believe that this is something which will be very valuable to us doctors and, and, and to the, of course then, then to the patients, our customers. And now when we start to use these e-health services, it means that we start to collect very rapidly, a lot of data. And if we now give these e-health services for a couple of years without collecting, without thinking how to collect the data, then we are too late. Then there are people who have thought about it and, and, and will beat us in, 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 in digital health and, and those who beat us will come from, not from Finland, but from IBM, Microsoft, from, from there, Google, those, those guys. And I think the idea is let's, we can't beat them, so let's work with them. That's, that's the general idea. Uh, that's what I heard from some, some IT people, that the real battle in, in terms of, of data today is, is who owns the clouds. And this was, for a layperson like me, I think it was quite frightening to, to get to know that basically Amazon manages one-third of the cloud services at the moment of the whole world. I don't know if this is right, but this was some reasonably reliable source where, where I got this. So, so it's almost like we start to have three or four of these kind of global huge oil companies who basically handle all the data and sooner or later start to also tell us what to do with the data. So this is what we have done in HUC. Uh, we have built a data lake Hadoop based data lake so that we basically can gather all the data that 
we create from different sources in one big data lake it we already pour all the electronic uh, pour all the electronic health record data in there but it will properly be, properly be up and running in um, September next year this is a joint venture and collaboration with Citra which you all know and basically if this works then it will be scaled up for the whole country but this is also all of you I think this is important to know that yes we are doing something for you a place to, to swim and, and, and plunge in, in our data lake uh, there will be metadata structure around this so that basically once we start to pour all the data in there it's also something we can use because today still the speak about Finland as a as a global actor in terms of all our valuable data yes we have a lot of data but but it's not always in a usable format for those who want to use it and also if we can get this kind of thing done which we will and actually almost have done it already it also means that we can do business with the data in a proper way that we just don't give it away too cheaply and it will be a great place for research and and uh, society to to use that data so this is i would say this is maybe one most important tool or structure i think we need to be good in digital health tomorrow and also offer possibilities to Finnish companies to, to help us to be better and it will help all of us. So data lake is coming. This is just about the privacy but we actually touched that topic already. I think one thing which I as a doctor I'm, I'm worried that, that people are very which is of course good thing they are very cautious and uh, strict that the electronic health records and health record data doesn't get into wrong hands and of course this is extremely important but the issue is that with, with all the social media gps i usually give accept button for everything what they ask for me to do with my iphone so basically there is so much data on us on many places already that basically some people who we don't even know can make inferences on our health much more than they would be able to do by reading our health records if you haven't been that sick so often there was already like few years ago a small study in scotland where they just combined the gps mobility and and uh, social media behavior and and just with kind of metadata they were able to to predict the, the depression episodes very nicely because once your GPS mobility decreases and your social media presence increases, not even knowing what you do in there, it's usually an early sign that the depression bout is about to come. So, so imagine what all they can do with these as cards and everything when they start to have hospitals as well. So I think that um, we have to understand that, that my data Oh, sorry. My, my data is my data and, and we have to have face, uh, uh, means to, to, to take care that our data is not used against us or you, against anybody else to that matter. Because then in big data, when you combine everything, you know how easily you can see all kinds of inferences and correlations. And the worst thing is that the correlation might be even wrong, but you can still do things based on that correlation. In that book, which was about Edward Snowden. There was some uh, high-ranked military from US when he was asked like, like what use there is of metadata? And, and he answered that we kill people based on metadata. So, so, so we don't understand what we are giving away when we are giving all those acceptations. And this is the second thing that those who have a lot of data, they basically have also more value for the data as you know that it's not a linear combination that if you put somebody has one data and the other one has two data actually this who has two data has more than two times the value of the data and that's the reason these facebook's and everybody wants to collect want to collect as much data on you as possible at with, with very little uh, reward for, for all that data. So we have to understand the value of our personal data and hope, 
I hope someday we'll have these kind of data banks that basically if I have that and that many petabytes data in, in different places, I can tell to my bank that you can give that data to these and these purposes and if I get the interest rate of, of that and that much or something like that. Because we as an individuals, we can fight all the big companies. But then we have to go from data to intelligence. I, this is the, maybe the most fascinating thing as, as, as a physician and doctor that when we come to this machine learning, I think maybe I even have too romantic idea on this because I'm a lay person and it, it sounds so magic, but, but basically what is the intelligence to my, as, as I understand it, it it's that the adaptive activity based on information. This is just, a, I don't know, its Finnish name is Roiskutta ja Tetra, but it's a fish that when it gives the eggs, it jumps on the leaf of the small tree and puts the eggs there and then jumps back to the water, and then for two days it just flips the water on the eggs. After two days, it kind of knows that the eggs are mature, it stops splashing, and then the eggs drop in the water, and the small fishes come out. So extremely complicated and intelligent thing, but we know that it's totally non-intelligent. It's just a, just a complicated instinct. And when I speak about machine learning, I think the big difference to knowledge engineering is that knowledge engineering, even if it's done very advanced, it's still just an artificial instinct, not artificial intelligence. But now when we come to machine learning, we're actually starting to speak about adaptive responses to same. But this is something you understand better, but this is something which is very interesting, very promising, but also we have to be very careful about the ethical and moral issues. That who is in charge? Is it the original learning algorithm? Is it what came up from the learning algorithm based on all the data which was put in the algorithm? Or is it the doctor who makes the decision? Or is it the device maker? Or who, who is responsible on, on what happened and what decision was made? We have now actually three machine learning initiatives starting when we just signed the agreement with IBM uh, two weeks ago. One is in imaging diagnostics and one is in cancer patients. And uh, one very interesting for me as a pediatrician, of course, is, is uh, how to prevent uh, septic, very, very severe bacterial infection is, is in, in small, small preterm babies. And they're really this small. We have 18,000 live births per year in our hospital, which means that there are a lot of these, these also these um, preterm babies. And one of the big threats in these babies is that they get the systemic bacterial infection uh, and it comes, in these small babies, it comes full board very rapidly in, in kind of hours. Uh, an hour ago, baby was looking happy and, and pink and an hour later, she's almost dying. So we want to know if with this machine learning we could predict that this kind of infection in, it is coming more rapidly than we have been able to do this far. This is of course a very costly issue as, as well, but, but I think when it's about the baby we shouldn't think about money that much. But of course you can use that money some elsewhere. And this was the first pilot was very simple. We just took the heart rate, respiratory frequency and oxygen saturation continuously and make the first based models based on that. And the situation was not that bad. Basically the specificity was 73%, but the sensitivity was only 30 and something. And of course we want to be very sensitive. We don't want to miss any of those infections. That's the most important thing. So now we start the second round with the prospective data and put more data in the, and let's see what Dr. Watson can do for us. But we have high hope for this and, and, and I really, really, really keen, to, really keen to, to, to hear the results in, in maybe six to seven months from, from now. And then finally, this is what it is all about. Now when we start to have so much data which we can base our decisions on and we don't have to guess so much. So what are the basic, what do we base our decision on. It, in healthcare, like last 10 years, the, the, basic, the basic story has always been about utilitarianism and utility of, of, of the patients. But if we are completely honest, actually very often doctors don't make 
decision based on utility of the patient, which means that you know just you value quality of life times time. And then you say that, okay, that was more for this patient than this patient, so we treat this patient. I give you one example. You have two breast cancer patients. One came today, both are 35, and, and the one who came today, you checked for some very expensive new biological therapy. And then tomorrow comes the next breast cancer patient, same age, but this patient has two kids. So basically, if you are utilitarian, you think that by keeping this last second lady alive with this expensive medication, you also increase the value of those two babies. So basically, I cancel my decision from the yesterday to give that expensive medication to that other lady. I think we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that kind of, or maybe we want, but, but uh, uh, today it's still so that once you have decided that this, have the medication, you don't back off from that decision. It would be ethically very, very difficult situation. So in many cases, and most of the customers and patients also agree with the fact that they don't want fully utilitarian world. It seems good, but actually it, it, it can create a very cruel society. This is, I, know, I, I guess you know these two guys. Jeremy Bentham, who was the father of, of utilitarianism, he was very, very eccentric guy. I think he spent 11 years thinking about, about, about how to deal with other people or something like that in isolation. And this is just one example on the same issue that you know this kind of greatest good for the greatest number of people, that there is a train coming and if you just push that fat guy uh, on the trails, basically these six persons will be saved. So you do actively something to kill one to save six and, and should you do it or not? This is, nobody has the right answer to that. But this is actually the kind of decisions which in future will be made in, 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 in our machines and our black boxes who then propose us different kind of therapies. This is just one uh, kind of um, uh, imaginary situation. Five years from now, you are able with the big data predict the, the survival very well in, in some patient. And basically the rule is that if the survival chance is more than 10%, you should go to the intensive care. If it's less than that, then you maybe think that is it worthwhile to, to, to continue the suffering. But then basically the same situation, but you have at the same time on a different ward, two dying patients, one waiting for a heart and one waiting for a liver transplant. And you know that this is tissue compatible, this patient in here. So basically, should you say that you have to increase this probability before you put that patient in intensive care instead of just letting him die and taking the heart and liver and give it to these patients who would die otherwise because it takes so long time to wait for a good donor. I think we don't want to do this, but, but maybe in future these kind of decisions are made inside the machines. And I think it's very important that we, you and, and, and me and citizens are in this discussion to decide in what kind of decisions in that black box we will have. So this was what I have to say as an introduction to what I have thought about when I think about digitalization of the healthcare. Lastly, yes, there are threats, there are things to be worried about, but still I think this is one of the greatest promises in, in, in healthcare. I'm very happy to be able to live that, that revolution uh, still in my working, working years. So really we are in the beginning of a very, very interesting and fascinating journey. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Visa. That was very, very interesting. Uh, I imagine we might have some questions here. Uh, Mikko Salminen. Uh, first, a comment to one of your uh, first slides where you compared the number of uh, 
young people and elderly people compared with the working population. Uh, yes, that's probably right, but looking from the medical point of view, the uh, healthcare cost related to the elderly people is much higher or they need more resources than the young, young people. So in that sense, it was misleading that the situation isn't now the same as it used to be 100 years ago. Yes, that's true. That was kind of provocative, provocation, yeah. yeah. And, and then the question, uh, can, can you see any like a single reason or, or a primary reason why Finnish healthcare in digitalization is lagging so much European leading countries? So what's the primary reason that we are laggard? I think this is an um, interesting question because if you look at the level of for instance, electronic health records we are using, or digital services we are using, we are not on a European level that much behind, no. I, I think it, it's maybe the, the picture which is today given is, is maybe a bit too grim. So I just visited UK and, and, and they are very much in a learning phase as well. And, and, and for instance, in this uh, issue of how to capture the big data, we are already ahead of them. But on the other hand, of course, we have to be honest and say that, that we should do better. Yeah, exactly. But we are not that bad as, as sometimes is thought about. We are maybe too modest also that Finland with Omakanta and, and, and all the electronic health records, which basically almost all the hospital use, use, hospitals use already, we are very advanced in terms of getting everything digitalized. I think sometimes some, some countries uh, present their results much more proudly and, and we should learn from there at the same time being very humble that, that we should be much, much faster and, 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 and because the population in Finland, we are so well educated, we are digitally very ready, so we should be ahead of every, everybody, so yes. Yes, we should do better. <laughs> yeah, one com comment to Omakanta, the only information I have in my Omakanta is my hoitotestamentti because I wrote it there. But yeah. nothing, there is no uh, incoming information from any of the other systems, yeah. that hospitals. That yes, and Omakanta is, is uh, troublesome in that sense that it's, it's not easily usable data. That's the problem. It's kind of a closet for the information. It's not the usable data format. And, and that's one of the reasons we try to now de develop these data lakes and everything. Yes, yes, exactly right. Anybody else? My name is Simo Salo. Uh, maybe this is more about the wellness if it yeah. wasn't on, on your agenda, but I really worry about uh, the old people and uh, I'm uh, looking for a project uh, so that uh, the old people would be given possibilities to self-service and uh, as the problem is that they are getting, well, they are getting old and there's not people to take care of them and, and they are lonely. So give them uh, self-service things to do and, and, and gather the information, the data and uh, make also uh, more possible to, to take all care, care of the crisis situations. So is there a project which aims to, to get old people activated and... Uh, I know, maybe you know more, but I, I know there is at least one, one big project in Finland which they aim to do exactly something of that measure, but I'm not involved in that, so I, I, I don't know more about it. Uh, sorry, before I... Uh, go ahead, yeah, sorry. Ah, okay, one, because before I, I finish, I would like to ask you, are you worried about all the information you, you give from yourself when you are around the net and, and do all the things you do in there? Or are you just happy that nobody will ever use it against you? In <laughs> Can I get some comment? Because you are experts in, in, I think you understand much more than, is it a threat or not? Uh, hello, Jere Kaiku. So in the uh, 70s, it was very hard to uh, tap a room to have the microphones there. And uh, nowadays, it's very hard to have a room where there is no uh, microphones available. 
and also uh, concerning the usage of uh, any uh, service, it of course leaves uh, traces that uh, are uh, more or less uh, easy to follow. And yeah. uh, well, we rely much on the uh, promise of the service providers currently. Yeah, yeah. Because I think the time span is what worries me that young people do stupid things and if they can't like leave them behind, that they come again against them in, in some situation in, in, in work interview or somewhere. It, it, it's, we know already cases where, for instance, an anorectic has keep an, a, a web diary for the worst months and days of, of his or her disease. And, and they are not very happy when they then get better and, and, and they, you know, it's, once it's there, it's there. So we have to respect also the, the right of, of, of people to be protected when they are not able to do that themselves. Maybe that, that's my mind. So one question, how do you ensure confidentiality of information and privacy? A, a few months ago, there were stories about some police officers receiving fines because, because of checking the details of Anneli Auer and, and some, of the, some of the sportsmen like Mika Myllylä. And, and some of those cloud services, they are also based outside of Finland. Yeah. And, and therefore, they are not covered by, by Finnish law when it comes to, yeah. comes to privacy. I'm not the best person to go to the technical uh, details, but basically we have this European Union cloud security test. I think it has 87 different items that anybody who works with us who wants to keep the data in some kind of cloud, it has to go through these checkups and if it's then considered to be safe. Even the Epic who is now building the new electronic health record and, 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 and treatment system, the American company, they had to build servers in, in Europe because we can't have any data on which is not in Europe, which is confidential. So I would say that currently my understanding is that we do all we can and, and follow all the strictest instructions and regulations because this is something which is extremely important for us. And good thing in electronic health records is that if somebody looks your record, you always leave a trace. You're always traceable that you know it was you and it was then when you look these records and somebody can come to you that ask like, why did you look them? When I was a young doctor or even not the doctor but already working in a hospital, everything was on paper and when I went to uh, get the papers for the doctor who, who wanted to have them for the patient. Actually, I had the whole, of course, the whole archive to, to go to and read everything I would have liked to read. So, and nobody would have called me because there was no ways to trace me. So even sometimes the traceability is, is a good thing also. Thank you. I, I, I think that's all the questions we had now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, I'm actually a graduate and a PhD from, from well, Helsinki University of Technology at that time, but now Aldo University. I think the last time I had a presentation was my PhD dissertation. But I'm very happy that there's still a blackboard. I don't know what I'm gonna draw there, but it's always nice that you can draw the equations. You were talking about black boxes that Watson just d does them, but I think Watson should also put the equations on the blackboard so mathematicians could check that he did it right. <laughs> um, so I, 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 um, I had my PhD in, in queuing theory, I have a mathematical background, but already when I was doing the PhD I, I realized that I want to do something, something real and, and, and I went into healthcare and I've been there for t over 10 years. So I, I worked at the blood service, I've been a consultant and now I'm at Terveustalo. This is my seventh week. So I hope you don't fire me with very difficult questions, but I'll try to find out <laughs> if I don't know how to answer them. Terveustal is the largest healthcare service company in Finland. It sometimes 
it differs a bit on who, who buys what company, who's number one, and we'll see who will be number one at the end of 2016, but especially based on the 2015 numbers. We're the 15th largest employer in, in Finland in healthcare, with the most satisfied employees in its field. And this is something very important when we talk about digitalization. And I'll get back to it at the end, but as I'm the operational head of operations, I look at the processes, I look at the people, and how we make the system work. Then we see also the digitalization makes, already now that we have good, um, good uh, systems is one reason why, why the doctors are satisfied. They like to work with us because things run smoothly and that's a very important part of digitalization. We offer services to private persons, corporate customers, the public sector and, and insurance companies. So a vast, we kind of say we have a vast number of payers that pay for the health care, but each, each patient is of course unique. Two and a half million visits to the physicians, sales over 500 million euros, and owned by, by inv capital investment company, but also Finnish um, institutional investors and, uh, I don't know, Eläke um, We have, being the, kind of looking at operations, we have 170 clinics, and that's, that's the largest amount, so we're, that's the largest amount of clinics that anybody else has in Finland, and that's something very important to think about now. Actually, location isn't a problem in, in coming to Tervestalo, but how, how we can have other means than just physical clinics. Is there anything else? Tervestalo strategy is kind of based on, on six important things, but Compared to Visa, I like to talk about sick people. For us, it's to promote health. So, of course, we take care of sick people, but we also want to make sure in preventive ways that you do not get sick, so you're healthier. We want people to be healthier and healthier and healthier. Um, superior customer experience, where I see the digitalization has, has, has a big impact. It all has to do with the relationship with our customer. And, and that's, in a way, in digitalization, if you look at apps, it's all based on, you kind of give all your information because you get something. It's actually, it is a relationship between, between the customer and the provider. And this becomes stronger and stronger in this area. The most desirable employer for professionals, we want our processes to be smooth, all, all, all our programs and, and the tools that we give them to be, to be good so that they want to work with us. And, as we are in 170 locations, kind of be locally, locally the best with at the same time being having kind of benefits of scale from this nationwide um, 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 how do you call it? <laughs> nationwide uh, web of, of clinics. Measurable medical outcome, I have a few slides on that, and that is a, that it has been, this, is, this strategy has been the same for over three years, so this kind of getting into this, measuring really the medical outcome and making decisions based on that has, has been a cornerstone already for three years and, and probably for the next five to ten years, and responsible social innovator. So we are in the private sector, and, and Visa was from the public sector, but I think that everybody already is understanding that we, we work together and, and social innovation can come from any, any direction. I was talking about this um, customer relationship. So we aim for a seamless cooperation between different stages of the service path. And I'm gonna talk quite a lot about this process view in digitalization and less about about all the different apps you could have, though I have to mention our app, of course. And this has to do with digital loyalty. So, in a way, often you think about, in, 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 the, in, in this field, that there's the patient and the doctor, and then they meet in a room, and, and that, that is the relationship. But in the future, there might be different relationships with us and the customer in between those, those visits to the doctor, based on based on data and, and other services, so for example, self-services and so on. But, but this, this is the loyalty, this is the fact that, they, they, that we're in the same path and they, they go on and on and on in that path. 
just to give you data, we have 3.6 million Finnish patient records in the national, nationwide patient information register. I like this as lake, uh, data lake because as you saw there, only one part of that, they are actually already have, have also this um, infra information register, patient information register in that data lake. And of course in the Omakanta you have it. And then you can enrich it with other data. People book appointments basically through, through the website and, and online appointments more and more. So that's kind of one big place where we've already digitalized our services and, and nearly 35% use mobile terminal to access the site. So use their phone or iPad. Uh, these are the quality cornerstones. So we look for operational excellence through medical quality, operational quality, customer experience. Now in the private sector, it isn't always so that the customer pays. You might, it might be the public sector that has buy services from us. It might be the, um, the, the, your, your employer. But at the end of the day, the customer experience has a really big share of, of your decision to do you come back or not. You kind of, we, we, we assume the medical quality, but we see that that is as important to always, to measure it and to prove it. And, and some, for some part of the operational quality, or the fact that the operational quality works out is a big part of the customer experience. For example, I've been doing process improvement for so long that if things don't went, go well operationally, I kind of, I don't care if they smile at me because I just want things to work out because I've been looking at processes for so long and, and looking at waste and I kind of assume that processes should, should just flow. But for others, it's different things. So we have to look at all, all three aspects, and, and that's, those are the, how we, we look at quality. And, that, and it depends on the customer, and depends on also the medical problem, which one is the most, most important at that time. So for us, for us we, we look at a lot at this customer experience, and that influences our choices. So regardless who's the payer of the service, everyone in the system, in the service path experiences. And, and, and if you choose, you choose where, where should I have, I have a problem, I need a doctor or some other um, um, professional to, to help me, you kind of, you think of Tervaustal at the first, and then, then you book. And, and, if, and that ha experience of booking has to work out. If you, if it, if you don't find a time, or then you, you change, change the provider. Okay, then you get the appointment. If that goes well, you're very happy with the experience. You maybe tell your friend and, and you, you, book your, you book a new time. The next time, the next time you need something, you're like, oh, I, like, I, want, I went there. Or there's maybe continuous, continuous service path. And then you become loyal. And these are kind of also the places in the process where we can lose the customer if, if we don't think about how, how they want to be serviced at those, point, those points. So it's not just the appointment. It, it, is, it is kind of booking again, finding your data after the appointment um, and the experience of, of the service in whole. So digital world, and this is what I have at the end, it, it has to do with we can kind of we can delight we can make service better or we can or we can cut waste and in that make make the service path smoother, and and doing that we of course hope that that the customer choice chooses us the next time also because we're doing things the right the right way. This is what Tervaustala has been doing. So we have or one example. I have a few examples in this presentation. We have an Oma Terveus application. It started around 2012 with, with 10,000 users. And now we have more than 400,000 users. And if you are occupational health customer, and I don't know if, I don't remember if all the <laughs> users, I think there is Otaniemi, at least VTT uses Terveustalo. You're able to have a chat, chat appointment with the doctor. And, and you can actually add video to it, and it's real time. And, and so we have 
we have new mobile applications starting this year. So this is growing and, and, and this Omatero is, is evolving all the time. So is those applications of, our, our, of other private sector um, companies. If you look at Mehilainen, they're very smart. They've put, um, as, as, at least for a mother, they've done exactly the right thing. I can, I can book appointments for myself, but, which I, of course, don't do anymore. And I can add um, my children's children's appointments. So I can, I can take care of the whole family, probably my husband's too, because I have to take care of that also. So they've kind of understood that it's more, there's maybe one person that is booking many appointments and you can put all that in the application, understanding the household need. Uh, this is, as I said, this is evolving all the time. You can, it started with booking appointments. Now you can see your data. You can see your lab results. You can, you can, um, have a chat discussion with, with a doctor. You can get reminders. You can get information. If, if you give um, permission for that, you can get inf information on, on things that might interest you based on your health records and so on. Now, this is customer loyalty, but we have to go deeper and, and really build relationships and, and in the way that a good kind of family doctor relationship is that this is, there, there, this is a place that I can trust throughout the years and the different, the different um, pro problems, health problems or others that I might have. And I find that here data is, is extremely vital. And, and when you go into medical quality, there's, there's big, a lot of data as, as Visa nicely, nicely showed. And we have the metrics, the data we gather from the health records, from all the different machines, from, from the um, um, MRI, magnetic, the pictures, x-rays, and so on. And, and we can put all that together. We also have, in a way, through the metrics and the data, already now benchmarking. So we can compare it to national best practices. And, and, and make this uh, variance analysis, deviance analysis, and understand where do we stand or where does this patient stand compared to others in the population, and then make actions based on that. And, and some of these we can automate, but already using them now is, 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 very, is a big step. It isn't always done. It m might be more that the doctor just knows, he's read the national best practices, he looks at the metrics, he kind of he maybe makes some analysis based on population, based on scientific papers, or he just knows it by experience that I've had 10 patients like this and you seem to be in the middle or you seem to be an out outlier and then, then makes actions. But we can, we can make this more kind of based on, on a bigger date, population data and, and make it more accurate. And, and this has been used for, for di di diabetes. So for, that's, that's a chronic disease. And I think it's better here. And, and in, 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 in it, it's actually preventing it, having, keeping it in, the, in uh, a balance is, is the key in, in keeping the, me uh, the medical costs minimum, and, but also the sick, sick day costs. So this is an example. Uh, we've, we have a program called Etudi, where um, we, we take the data from the health records and then do basic decision, decision analysis. And each physician can, when they see the patient, see the records and, 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 and see, for example, that what quartile you're lying, this patient is compared to others. Or if you look at the whole occupational health customer, you can tell you can tell the CEO of the firm that, that you have 1,000 employees and did you know that 10% actually have, have um, sick leaves due to a chronic disease and, and if this is treated well, you'll have less sick leaves and they're, they're able to, to work, which usually people also want themselves. So you can identify people with the risk of developing diabetes and invite them to receive care when necessary, but also recognize patients that already have diabetes, but is it in good or poor treatment balance, and monitor then the, inflammation, uh, the implementation of the care based on, on these good guidelines that are done, done in Finland and, and, and other countries. 
and, and, and basically you can, on average, save up to 10 sick leaves uh, per, per year, and also the basic thing is that you're healthy. And this is, this is important because this is one example and there are other chronic diseases, but if we look at Finnish healthcare expenditure, 15% of the total healthcare expenditure comes from diabetes treatment. So, so understanding this has a, has a real economical potential and that money can be used in, in for example, pedi pediatric care, if that is where it is needed. So we did, based, we have 475,000 pe people in receiving uh, occupational health services. Out of them, 11,000 are diabet di diabetics and, and around 33,000 are pre-diabetics and 2,000 we know that, that don't, are it but don't have a diagnosis. So there's, there's kind of 11,000 that, 11, that are diagnosed and 35,000 that are in a way potential. And, and compared kind of if you put those numbers to the Finnish population, we have in Finland 250,000 that are not aware of their illness. But we already see it from, from different health records if we, if we go through this, um, this process that we did with the EDUDI. So diabetics with poor treatment balance have around 27.2 sick leave days a year. And those that have a good treatment balance have 15.1. And, and the difference in cost, if, we, if you really look at, if you look at our customers, it's 320 million a year. But if you look at the whole Finnish population, it's over 2 billion a year, which I think is almost enough to take care of this whole sort of thing. And <laughs> we could just look at this. But this is a very kind of simplified, we didn't need Watson here. We may, might need it in something more, more, um, interesting and, and more difficult, and I'm sure there's other applications, but this is a very kind of beautiful example that, that there's, there is a big, there's 15% a quite clearly defined part of population that incurs, incurs costs. We, we, it is, there are very good guidelines nationally to take care of them, and just looking at the data, which actually is already in each provider and who has it, and everybody has it that has been treating diabetics, you can, you can make these, um, these analyses and then, then uh, treat them. So these are kind of from the different, one, one is about the customer experience side of the quality, one was about the medical, medical quality, and then the third from, from that triangle, the operational um, quality and operational efficiency and looking at the processes. At the same time, I, the, uh, the, the processes are the backbone of what we do. It's, that is where the things happen. The treatments are given and the decisions are made. And those have to also fuel the change. So we have to have modern equipment and modern ways of doing it so that, that all these nice visions that we have really happen. I've, as I said, I've been doing process improvement, and of course, I have that um, past in queuing theory, which I don't remember that much. But but the basic thing is that you 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 walk in, and then there's steps of things that are done. This might be a web, or this might be a circle, but it's easier to draw it as a line. And and some of the steps on that path are kind of add value and others are just waste, but you just have to do them because something isn't working. We're, we don't live in a perfect world. And the longer this queue is, or the, these steps are, the longer you, you spend in this system. And the shorter, and the longer it is, the more complex it also is, and there's more managing to do because you probably need a few people at least in, in, in the different steps and you always need a manager and the less steps you have, usually the, the service path for the customer is shorter and, and, and the managing is, is easier. So simplification usually makes, makes life easier. But here you have, you really have, you have to look at, you ha kind of have to identify which steps add value to the, to the customer and based on data you can do more analysis on that and identify which, which steps then are non-value added steps and they're the waste. And also, quite often waste comes from things, 
I mean, they, they make it longer, they make it more annoying, the, the whole service path, they incur cost. It's also a potential time when the customer interrupts the service. So, so maybe the queue comes from the fact that, that there's a lot, or the waiting, the waste comes from a long queue, and you're just, you're like, oh, I'm not gonna stay here and, and, and queue for one hour, or sometimes you have to queue for two months to get into surgery. I have other things to do, and you leave, leave the system. And, um, okay, maybe I'll go back. And I see that the digitalization actually gives us very good um, possibilities to, to, to take care of these waste parts. So if we, know, if we know when our customers are coming in, we can put the, the, the uh, people at the right spots and nobody has to wait. We can, we can move the resources according to demand. Or we can, if, if the problem is that there is waste, so you, you, you come somewhere and then they don't have all the, your information and they ask you to go to the fifth floor because there you have this information, you have to register there. If the data is available to all, you're, you're, you, you've been saved a lot of walking and looking for data because it's, it's right there where, where you ask it. So it doesn't matter where you ask it, you, you will find it. It's not that some different floors. Or um, just information flow. So that's why I actually, I was, I, was, I was getting worried about this black box that just does something and we don't know because everything that I've been doing with processes is that we have a lot of medical doctors that are black boxes. They just, they, they get all the information and then they give a diagnosis and we don't actually know what they're thinking and we're trying to make that open so that we can make good system decisions and, and that is an important part of removing, removing waste. Um, as I told you, I've been in the blood service for 10 years, the, the Finnish blood service, and there we worked quite a lot on benchmarking in European blood services. And we actually wrote, uh, well, this is like maybe a semi-scientific paper, but, but it's a scientific paper in, in, in an international society of blood transfusion conference on the benchmarking results. And why I wanted, why I actually remember this when I was doing this presentation, because here we have, um, we, we look at the process and we look at if the process has low productivity, high productivity, no flow, good flow. And we all want to be in the ideal state where we're very high productive, it doesn't cost that much, but the customer is satisfied. Things flow and things, things run smoothly. And quite often we're in some other state and trying to get to the ideal state. And if you want some basic mathematical theory, more variance you have, the harder it is to, to get up, up to the upper corner. So, so the borders are, are based on the variance. And this is, this is the theory, this is the lean management theory. But what we did was that for many, it was actually 10 years of benchmarking, we came up with different key performance indicators to understand how this system in, in blood donation. So if you know something about blood service, you, um, it's in, in Europe it's based on volunteer blood donors. So the customer experience is one way of getting them to volunteer and getting them to come. But actually they're volunteers so they come when they want to come. So they might, there might be zero blood, blood donors or then there might be because of a campaign 1,000. So sometimes there's no cues in and too many too many people waiting for them and sometimes long queues and, and too little, not enough people. And it's usually, in, at least in, in, in Europe, mainly a public, public service. And so we wanted to help this, this and, and, and the blood is then sold, sold to hospitals, so at the end of the day, the hospitals pay for the blood. So making this process more efficient, we were able to, to reduce the cost of blood. So we went through different key performance indicators, but that, that was one part of the benchmarking. But already at that time, it, this was a year ago, and the work was done a little, a little over a year ago, we really wanted to understand how to drive decisions based on data, because not enough of the process was analyzed on data. And, and really think about how customer experience expectations help us design efficient processes. There are some digital means, for example, booking yourself or 
uh, doing a questionnaire online that actually usually is what customers want to do because they can do it whenever and they don't have to queue that long or wait that long. And it at the same time helps, uh, help, helps to design efficient processes. So it's a win-win and to identify those. And then we had an analysis on asked by these, these uh, blood service providers that what digitalization could, could help. I'm not going to go into it, but this is kind of, I thought this is a good example of, we talk about really great big data and Watson coming into medicine, and at the same time, this is quite a good snapshot of where the blood services were, were in Europe a year ago, but where healthcare is. We're actually here still talking about, can I do an online survey of my, my, my health? And, and, and they still, quite many do it on paper just before they're giving blood. Even in Finland, they still haven't been able to do the online survey because it's health data and it's not that easy and, and you have to come up with different ways to do it. In Denmark, they already do it quite nicely. And, and so this is, this is kind of a nice process view of where digitalization can, can help. Um, this is something that I've been showing at Tervostalo and in many other places lately because everybody talks about Uberization and, and, and we have to do the same thing that Uber did to taxis in the healthcare. And, and then there's different aspects to it. Somebody says that it's, it's nice people servicing nice people, so maybe we should ha just have nice doctors servicing nice customers and then we give each other thumbs up or thumbs down or stars. Or, or we, we know that it's actually one way of really help in the US it started because there wasn't taxis, it was impossible to get a taxi. So this, the Uber was able to, to solve this basic customer problem. But it's also automization of operational management processes. So a lot of just basic management processes which incur a lot of costs is that you're reading, you already have the data, but then it's in Excel and then you print it out and then you have a one-to-one -one discussion with with the person is saying that, okay, your numbers look bad, why is this? And maybe you do it once a month when nobody remembers what happened 25 days ago. And, and you could also, in a way, and there was a nice Financial Times article, but I didn't have time to put it here, that, that, that the thing that you should automate is management processes and managers. And the managers could actually be the robots. And then things would be much smoother. So these are kind of, this is uh, the, the, the four elements, or, and I would like to add the fifth element, uh, employee engagement, and, and giving employees good digital tools to do their work. But we can think of having the basic processes, which is quite a lot what I think of, because I see that that's, that's the, the short-term place where we need digitalization. So you can automate things, you can, you can utilize data more, as I showed you with diabetes. You can get the patients to do more themselves. They usually want to do it themselves. I was actually quite, I haven't looked at this, um, what Hus has, but I saw the, the commercial of, of this woman's place where you can, you can go through the different steps that you have. I remember being myself pregnant actually would have, at that moment, you wanted to look at all the videos and all the, all the information that the, that the Finnish Neobola system can give you and not wait for that appointment that you have where you're then given leaflets. So I, I can actually understand that that, that makes, that's just something that, that the customer wants, but it also makes things cheaper for the public, public health sector. But of course, you can look for totally new ways of, of doing digitally in uh, care. And, and here I think in the beginning, you'll probably start more in the wellness sector from uh, preventive health because it's, it is um, closer to, to a service, and, but it will go deeper and deeper into medical, medical care, but that there's just more regulations to that. So it's easier to start where it's easy. So for me, looking at things from the operational model and the process, digital tools and, and ways to think and ways to use data give us new ways to add value. So totally new services based on data, totally new things that we kind of start understanding from the data. It might be personalized medicine, but it might be something that we haven't even realized, realized yet. And also new ways to remove waste from the process to, so that the information flows 
faster, it's more open, the data is accessible from, from different, for different professionals and from different um, directions. It's fast data access and you can make the decisions at, with, at the customer where it happens. You don't have to wait to ask a second opinion somewhere or other. You can, you can take a video and ask it right away. You can do an, a quick data analysis and, and, and make the decision. You can be mobile. You don't have to go to the physical clinic as you can already now if you're a, 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 a operational health customer, for example, for Tervastalo, you can already see the doctor with, with your mobile phone. And, and other remote and self-services, which give you more, more services and also make, make it, makes it faster. And it's a win-win for, for all, everybody because it's just, it's, um, it's faster and it's cheaper and it's better. So thank you. And if you have any, you can, here you have my details so you can, you can ask me questions also afterwards. But we still have time. Thank and uh, I think we might have some questions again. Anybody? <laughs> Just one. Be bold and brave. Hi, you mentioned the Etudi tool. Mm. If I understood, that was a tool used by Terveystalo. Yes, it, it's our, our in-house made. Okay, what is, uh, do you have a tool for cooperation with the patients to take uh, for better treatment of diabetes? Oh, you mean like, like self-monitoring tools or? Except one example of, of those, or what is your opinion for those? I, I, th I think it's a, it's a natural next step of, of measuring your own um, glucose level, blood glucose level, and, and, and continuing. So you don't have to come to the appointment or to the lab to do it. You can also self-monitor. Self and this, this is, all these, these are in, in the making, and this was kind of a first step to, to, understand, to understand the population as a whole and to look at, look at one. But yes, those, those are coming all, all different ways. But it's, I think, I, 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 as I said, I, I, I joined Terrestal six weeks ago, so this was already done before, before I joined. But I think it's a nice example of how you can already do now with the data. I know that, that um, Apotti says that when Apotti is ready, we're also able to do diabetes, and then there will be a lot of save, saving for the money. But the, the data actually already exists, and you can make, the decision tools are quite simple. You can code it quite easily already now. And of course, you can then scale it up and, and make it even better all the time. Uh, hi. Uh, you mentioned that your own application earlier. And we, will talk, we were talking about how important it is for healthcare business. Uh, if, if they make a soft, software, it has to work mm. really good. Uh, and I checked your software in uh, the Play work? Store. Terves Talo Oma Terves, and it only has 3.5 stars. And mm -hmm. all the recent uh, comments are like, this is shit, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, it's completely piece of shit, it doesn't work. But did you, did you <laughs> download it? Did you try no. it yourself? <laughs> uh, and the thing is that I have personally no experience of Terves Talo. Mm. But the problem with this uh, is that if I want to use Terves Talo, my only experience now mm -hmm. is one star out of five, it's completely useless. Exactly. <laughs> and, and that's what I, and I, I agree with you fully. And that's what I was saying, that you kind of, you start there and, and now you listen to me and now you already got interested in Terves Talo and then you went and maybe you booked or you looked at it and, and you're kind of exiting already. But and this is, again, all I can say is that, that more is coming and, and there's an upgrade. And I agree with you. If I look at what Mehilainen has now, or what Diakor, eh, Mehilainen just got theirs out of, uh, later than us, but a new version, they are a step ahead. But this is the way that you do with applications yeah. all the time. So but there's the, a new version coming. But my then. point was that because it's, uh, it's my health, mm. it's not some game that I, I just. Exactly. 
I, I, want, I want it to work. Yeah. And it, it has deli delicate information but now you about it. Because it's your health and because it's so important, you have to try it yourself yeah. and see <laughs> how it works. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I guess that was it. Thank you.